Thank you. Our next panel discussion is disinformation and conspiracies, assessing threats and risks online. So it follows very well from the last conversation. Um, specifically, the session will consider the risks posed by disinformation and conspiracies in the online space and the potential offline impacts on social cohesion, politics, and security. This conversation will be moderated by Mike Isakoff, Chief Investigative Correspondent, Yahoo News. Mike, come on up. Greetings. Um, so uh, as, um, as was just explained, this is a, a, a panel on disinformation and uh, conspiracies assessing threats, threats and risks online. And I am joined by Mark Owen Jones, an assistant professor uh, in digital humanities at Hamed bin Khalifa University here in uh, Qatar and uh, uh, Zach Schwitzky, who is the founder and CEO of Limbic, which is a, uh, a, a research firm that has done a lot of work in this area. Um, I want to start out uh, by citing a, um, a passage that was in the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee report that was released just last week um, about the efforts by the Trump White House to influence the Justice Department, to pressure the Justice Department to try to change the outcome of the 2020 election. And there's one passage in there where uh, they disclosed that uh, Mark, on New Year's Day 2021, Mark Meadows, who's the Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, emails a YouTube video to uh, Jeff Rosen, who was then the acting Attorney General of the United States, um, uh, asking him to investigate the content of this YouTube video. The YouTube video uh, promoted a conspiracy theory uh, known as Italy Gate, which postulated or claimed that um, a uh, tech uh, employee of an Italian aerospace firm had worked with the CIA to um, manipulate the voting systems in the United States during the uh, November election uh, to switch votes from Joe Biden to Donald Trump. Now, needless to say, there was not a shred of evidence to back up this bizarre conspiracy uh, theory, but here it was being promoted by the one of the most powerful individuals in the U.S. government, the chief of staff to the president of the United States. I said on my podcast the other day that it sort of reminded me of the time that my uh, then 11-year-old son um, showed me a YouTube video asserting that Australia did not exist. Um, and I... Um, you know, gently took him to the globe and showed him, yeah, Australia really is a thing. But I guess I want to just start out asking um, my two panelists here, what do we do about a world where one of the most powerful people in the country is buying in and spreading a crazy conspiracy theory on YouTube? And Mark, why don't you go first? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> what do we do, uh, apart from, you know, uh, run for cover? Uh, but I think there's a number of issues uh, that we need to do to tackle this. Firstly, people like the former president of the United States were never operating in a vacuum, right? The election of Trump comes on the back of the post-truth age. Now, there was narratives that were prevalent at the time about what the post-truth age meant. In, in the UK, for example, there was discussion about, you know, amongst people on the right that were sick of experts, right? So this narrative that basically questioned those who were knowledge about science, scientists, educators, was something that was uh, becoming widely accepted among the population. 
So when you have someone like Donald Trump who, who, who actually you know, indulges this sentiment by spreading false information, he's not preaching to a vacuum. He is uh, finding a rapport with a large group of people who uh, probably believe in the same kind of things. And I think on a very fundamental level, uh, one of the previous panelists, Fatima, she mentioned the notion of, of critical thinking and the, the, the idea that uh, in Nigeria, education had become a, a national security issue. And I take, I mean, I do take issue with the, the idea of securitizing education. But at the same time, one of the th fundamental things that drives people's willingness to believe or indulge uh, such conspiracies and false news is a lack of, lack of critical and expansive thinking. So it really starts on a very pr primary level there. Having said that, you know, I want to take the, the, the conversation as well onto notions of what role platforms play and what role things yeah, like... No, we'll, we'll get to that, yeah. but I, you know, it just is striking. Look, uh, when you're the chief of staff to the President of the United States, you have access to you know, all the most sensitive intelligence that mm. the United States government has in the world. Um, and clearly, um, uh, Mark Meadows chose to disregard uh, all of that in order to promote a conspiracy theory that was of you know, politically advantageous uh, to his boss, the President of the United States, who is demanding that the, they find evidence to back up his claims. Uh, Jason, your thoughts on this? Um, so I have a bunch, and I think going back to your question about what do we do about it, um, the first issue that I struggle with is just how we frame even this panel, right, talking about mis- and disinformation, because to me that immediately says something's true or false, right? And I think what we saw, you know, looking at the uh, claims of election fraud and what, uh, you know, led to January 6th is, to the people that believe this stuff, it's true, right? It is their truth, right? So I think, as Mark said, we live in a post-truth world, which makes dealing with it difficult. And I think framing how we think about this, right, kind of the I'm wrong or I'm right, you're wrong approach with the way that we name this immediately alienates people. And what we've seen in a lot of the work that we've done is taking this stance of I have my version of the truth or what I believe in, and what I'm trying to do is convince you that I'm right is not the way to approach this stuff, right? It's understanding why certain narratives resonate with certain communities, why they believe what they believe, and how do we subtly move them off of that belief and closer to our belief, but not immediately go in and say, I'm right, you're wrong, I need to get you over here. Um, I think w when we look at, um, and I know, you know, Mark, you alluded to it uh, a little bit, um, it's a, certainly a multi-dimensional uh, problem, but when we think about, and a lot of the um, you know, panels and, and speakers over the last couple of days have spoken about you know, education and sort of these longer term uh, sort of governmental approaches to this, and I don't want to discount the importance of that, but the work we do, we think about this much shorter term, and what concerns me is midterms next year, based on what we saw in 2020 on January 6th and what we're currently experiencing and what the ramifications could be if l legitimate losers of an election don't accept the result. So we don't have a generation between now and midterms 2022. So while I think all that stuff's critically important, what do we do in the next 11, 12, 13 months? Yeah, I mean, the question is, how do you break through to a substantial segment of the American population that actually believes this stuff and wants to believe this stuff. When you say breakthrough, could you, do you mean sort of, how do you tell them that <laughs> this <laughs> that narrative what is, they believe is not the desirable is, narrative? You know, complete BS. <laughs> yes, that there's nothing to support. I, th I think in what they believe is the, is, is the truth. But well, this is where the, the line be between, um, I think, traditional approaches to security and information actually overlap. One of the things that's been found to, to be successful in attempting to access audiences who have those beliefs that you wish to change, <laughs> to be diplomatic, is to find trusted people within those communities and then try and change their beliefs. So rather than focusing on a large group of people 
and, and trying to collectively change the message, which is, can be effective, but it's not as effective as finding a, a, a key interlocutor in that community and being able to change their views and then that having a knock-on effect. Because what we see a lot in, in the disinformation ecosystem is it's not a flattened space. Despite all that talk about what happened in Capitol Hill being, you know, uh, or the talk of, you know, white nationalist movements being non-hierarchical, you know, I don't generally buy that. Within any of these communities, whether it's, it's white nationalist kind of extremists uh, or other terrorist organizations, there are people within those communities who exert a significant amount of influence over them. So what, what's an example of that working, of where a influencer is able to turn around the um, conspiratorial beliefs of you know, his or her fellow brethren? Well, I think the examples are, uh, are less about them uh, knowing that we, we don't necessarily know that they convert their beliefs, but we certainly know that they, uh, by saying a certain thing, they are less likely to encourage their followers to spread those beliefs, right? So it's not always about change of mind because it's very hard to change people's minds when you have issues of confirmation bias ideology. You can't, even like we said, we're dealing with a short-term time window, a short horizon. It's hard to really convince people to change their mind. But what you can do, you can sow sufficient doubt to prevent them being so convinced that they feel the need to share their ideas. And that's, that's, you know, that's what we've seen, yeah. we've seen like, in the Gulf region. I mean, I, I, I want to talk about that, but uh, you know, when I look um, at the landscape in the United States, yeah. you know, where everything becomes politicized. So let's take, for instance, the anti-vax campaign or resistance to getting vaccinated, um, which is you know, most prominent, not exclusively, but most prominent among the supporters of Donald Trump. It was Donald Trump who actually you know, uh, pushed for the development of the vaccine and then was taking credit for the fact that you know, under his um, you know, leadership, uh, a vaccine got developed. And he even told his followers at one recent rally that he had gotten vaccinated and sort of gently suggested they should and was met by boos because they were so worked up. Because the very idea of being vaccinated, because at that point, Biden was pushing for vaccination, it became a political issue. What do you do when everything is political? When, it, when everything is measured by does it help one side or, the other, or hurt the other? So uh, two things, and starting or going back to what you said about belief, I think believability in this is key, right? Um, and that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is thinking about the emotive drivers of why this stuff resonates, which I think leads into a key point. And when, when you think about the politi politicization of vaccines, I think there's a deeper issue there that, you know, it comes back to politics, elections, right? And by looking at um, creating or furthering this vaccine hesitancy, Right, and saying now, you know, that we've got a democratic, you know, president and administration, and you know, so they've essentially taken responsibility. I think there's, you know, political motivations there that ultimately, um, when we look at, you know, the midterms in 2022, the agenda is really about, um, you know, winning an upcoming election, even though sort of the vehicle to get there is about something that's seemingly unconnected to politics and. Um, you know, a vaccine or a pandemic or whatever it may be. And um, one of the, uh, I, I think on this point, um, when we look at, you know, the pandemic, right, going back to early last year, um, we, one of the guys that I work with classified, as a, classified it as a disinformation superhighway because what was really interesting about it is it had sort of the staying power, there was someone to blame, it had, you know, foreign aspects to it, especially, you know, around the origins of it. And you see that so many different topics and agendas use the pandemic to sort of further be seemingly unrelated topics. So I think there's something really interesting and, you know, uh, difficult, for lack of a better word, when we look at vaccine hesitancy, and I think it's sort of in this, um, you know, broader landscape of really meant to or going to have real political implications around, you know, upcoming elections. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I want to sort of take a step back and um, talk a bit about how we got here. And um, Mark, I know you, you've done a lot of work in this area, and you know, one sort of striking development to me is um, if you look back at the Arab Spring, which um, in which the democratic message of reform was being spread primarily by this new social media tool, Twitter. And it was embraced as um, this new form of communication um, that could lead to democratization and uh, liberalizing reforms and a new birth of freedom in a region that had, had precious little. Um, and yet, what we've seen, and this is one of the crueler ironies of the story of the Arab, Arab Spring, is that very tool became the vehicle for conspiracy theories, disinformation, and ultimately, and I know this is uh, work you've done, Mark, um, uh, being used and manipulated by those very autocrat same autocratic governments that the Arab Spring protesters were um, marching against. Talk a little about how this evolved. Well, I think it's a very interesting trajectory. And what I'd say, for anyone who's used Clubhouse, the new kind of uh, talk-based app, I think most technologies uh, have a honeymoon period, right? And so the, the Arab uprisings basically were the honeymoon period for Facebook and Twitter in particular, and, and YouTube to an extent. People approach technology, and in a way they believe the hype. So you have Silicon Valley talking about these products that connect people and facilitate conversation, and then obviously in, in, in the Middle East, on the back of a global recession, you have political demands for change. So you've got this kind of uh, you know, brewing political situation, this new technology that allows communication and mobilization, and then people's sudden ability to be able to express themselves freely in, a, in, in a, a context where they're not used to that, right? And when a new technology comes about in this way, there's a certain amount of naivety on people's parts. And I saw this particularly in Bahrain when I was studying my PhD. People were adopting this technology and not thinking about the potential consequences. Because for them, notions of surveillance through Twitter or Facebook were, were not extant. But the appropriation of these technologies happened very quickly. I think there's a tendency for people to think that, oh, Facebook, Twitter, 2011, maybe took about four years or five years before these technologies would be co-opted. They were co-opted almost immediately. You know, and, and to give some very concrete examples, you know, for example, in Bahrain, a small place, and why context is important, you know, people would, reflecting their naivety, go to places like the Pearl Roundabout and take photos of themselves, not because they were particularly opposition, but because it was an event and they wanted to, you know, just see what it was like. And then they post those pictures on Facebook. They didn't have any privacy settings, partly because as well social media companies weren't that uh, strict about privacy settings in this, in this era, so they could do that. Uh, and then people would take screenshots of them, post them on Twitter and say, this person is a traitor, arrest this person. They put their phone number uh, by them. And, you know, you'd have accounts doing this, vigilantes, circulating thousands of accounts. This was happening in 2011. One of these accounts was known to have broken international law in an independent report commissioned into the study of the uprisings, right? So these kind of incidents were known very early on. And then social media companies, again, are lax, and this has been said several times, have refused to take action. And when they have, it's only after severe political pressure. So, to, uh, you know, I'm very cynical about the desire of social media companies to actually try and do something meaningful to tackle the authoritarian abuse of technology. And that's one of many factors that's actually resulted in this abuse of it. You know, what we have is a situation where people, the argument that technolo technology, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or other things, is fundamentally emancipatory, that it gives people the ability to talk freely, is false and true at the same time. Because technology is used, it determined by the social context. If you have a country, you know, that where Silicon Valley exists, that has a constitution that espouses values of free speech, it's very normal for people in that context to create technology that believes will create free speech. But if, you, uh, uh, if it exists in a place where you have you know, laws that prevent criticism of, of government uh, and you know, intrusive surveillance, it's going to be used as a tool of surveillance. So the, the fact that no one actually saw this coming, I don't believe. And it was co-opted very quickly. And there are countless examples I can use about it. And one of the most recent ones, obviously, 
very central to, to where we are was in Qatar in the Gulf crisis. Uh, and some of the biggest abusers of technology are in the Middle East. I mean, right. empirically. Right. Although, you know, what's striking to me is that, um, you know, we all spent a lot of time in the aftermath of the 2016 election talking about what the Russians did, what the Russian Internet Research Agency did. That was the troll farm in St. Petersburg that was uh, uh, planting all this uh, divisive content uh, on Facebook uh, during the campaign, designed to sort of rile people up and mostly rile them up against uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, yet, that same template of what the Internet Research Agency was doing, the troll farms, you know, has since been adopted by governments in the Middle East, right? And using the same techniques to sort of, you know, alter the course of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, and I think it is a tendency uh, to think that China and Russia uh, are the, the ones who invent these strategies and then they're replicated. Uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult to tell who comes up with these. And I would certainly say my research on the region would suggest that uh, some of the tactics that we see, because they're not all the same, uh, are just as likely to come from within the region. Whether they ha happen with you know, expertise from other countries remains to be seen. But I don't necessarily think um, they, they, they originated in Russia. I mean, one of the interesting things, if I was to ask you, you know, Twitter, for example, it publishes all the accounts it takes down as part of its state-backed secur uh, security right. statements. So any, any accounts it believes are part of a foreign informa uh, information operation, they take down and they publish the data. Firstly, they don't publish it all. They publish a selection of it. But if I was to ask someone who were the biggest offenders on that list, I mean, people would probably say Russia, China. But actually, a China in this context is the highest. But it's actually followed by, uh, from between the p period of 2017 and 20, for the quartet countries. So Saudi, UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain, well not Bahrain, but Saudi, UAE, Egypt, mm -hmm. and, and the United Arab Emirates. They are the biggest violators of Twitter's foreign-backed influence operations campaign, according to Twitter's data, which is openly available to anyone, right? right. Yet, we continually talk about China and Russia being the main problems here. And this isn't a parochial issue. The thing that we have to understand about the disinformation landscape is that regions export it. And, and this has been talked about in the context of US politics till the cows come home. Russian interference in the US elections. You know, what's China doing? But you know, I've documented, I mean, you talked about, uh, you talked about a Twitter account of uh, a US official previously spreading this information. But when t Donald Trump's Twitter account was active, the comp his account was compromised in a way that conventional cybersecurity expert wouldn't necessarily think about. His tweets about Gulf politics were being artificially amplified by thousands of fake accounts, right, to increase the salience of them in the algorithm. So that means anything that Trump was saying about politics in the Gulf region mm -hmm. was being artificially promoted. And this is the President of the United States, and he doesn't have full sovereignty or autonomy over his communication channel. Neither does the United States in who that is, Who is promoting? Uh, in this case, it was uh, probably Saudi-connected uh, counts. They were promoting Trump's uh, anti-Iranian position. Right. And, and it, was, it was a very clear uh, a case of a bot accounts. The thing is, we, it's also hard to attribute. The, another issue with this information, and this is partly to do with transparency, we can only hypothesize in many cases who is actually behind an operation. You could look at an operation and say, who does this benefit? And they might be the likely promoters of it. But unless you have certain information, you, you're only speculating. Right. And this is also the same issue with Russian information operations and Chinese right. ones. Yeah, if it's in Chinese and it's targeting a Chinese audience, you know, it's likely that it's, it's Chinese, right? But how do you know? Unless yeah. you have IP details and this kind of thing, which is very hard to come by. Well, on that note, um, Zach, you did, um, yeah, your firm did research for a report by the Safan Center about how um, uh, these adversary governments, um, Russia, China, um, Iran, were promoting QAnon conspiracy theories um, uh, around the globe. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, it's, a, it's sort of like head scratching as to how it would serve their interests to promote 
you know, this crazy content that was spread by QAnon. But so tell us about, you know, the research you did on that, how you reached the conclusions you did, and I guess more importantly, why? Why would, you know, state-sponsored um, actors um, be spreading, you know, bizarre stuff like QAnon? Well, I think so. Uh, an easy way to sum it up, looking at 2016 compared to you know 2020 or now, is that we we as Americans have made Russia in particular's job significantly easier, right? Because there's a bunch of crazy stuff that we put out. Russia just amplifies it versus having to originate it, and it's not that binary, but. Um, it's a lot more about amplification now. And if you think about Russia in particular, which differs you know, significantly from China in terms of their agenda, if your uh, primary objective is just to further social discord, right? why not use what's already out there and decisive and just use your resources and capabilities to amplify it? I think to Mark's point, which is spot on, um, when we look at uh, foreign influence. I think the, the way we think about it is um, it's foreign originated or it's foreign amplified and they're kind of one and the same because um, as Mark said it's very difficult to know with certainty where something originates and I think one it's you know where these accounts are based if they're Russian or Chinese or you know Saudi anywhere else but also now we've seen a lot of evidence um, that you know Russians and Chinese in particular are outsourcing this right, black or dark PR firms in Philippines, Thailand, Ukraine, you name it. So if you do have lo the location... Explain the that. How, how, do they out how does this work, the outsourcing? So if you're a PR firm in, the, in Thailand, and Google did a, a great paper on this, um, where they actually went on the dark net and, you know, f found somebody to hire to do this work to see how the process worked. But if you're a legitimate PR firm in the Philippines and you can try to do that work and make whatever you're going to make, or you get, you know... Uh, uh, state actor coming in and saying, here's what we want to use, utilize your services for, and they're going to pay you significantly more. They're taking those offers, and so... So I think th th these are real examples of a, a Filipino PR firm gets hired by who? People, rep or, or organizations, agencies, individuals representing states, and that's where it becomes... Can you give a... I mean, is there a specific example of which, which government... So we've seen, sponsored excuse entity. me, we've seen examples yeah. with both the Russians and the Chinese. And it makes it, you know, I think to piggyback the point mm -hmm. Mark was making is, it's very difficult, it makes it more difficult to look at um, attributing a campaign or content to a particular country, because now, even if you do know the location, you see it in the Philippines, right? But the objective or the agenda aligns with, you know, China or Russia. And there's one case that was really interesting that, you know, we've referenced in the past where it was one group of accounts that we could attribute back to um, uh, an email address in the Philippines. And uh, I forget the exact date, but it was April of last year where they went from very aligned with Russian interest and almost overnight became aligned with Chinese interest, right? So, and without any more sort of proof than that, it said to us, here's an example of somebody that was working on behalf of the Russians and then took, you know, the resources and capabilities that they had and just repurposed them for a different customer. So, on the, 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 the spread of the QAnon conspiracy theories, by these actors. What did you find there? And to Mark's point about how do you make the attribution that these were state-sponsored accounts that were promoting this? So, I go back to, and I'm generalizing, but I think the, you know, motivation um, for foreign actors to get involved with, you know, QAnon conspiracies is, it's convenient, it's easy. Um, the attribution, um, we look at it in two ways, right? Known, what we call known foreign accounts, where we have some information that tells us where these accounts are based or the you know, content is originating, and then likely. And what we're doing there is um, looking at a whole lot of characteristics, both about the accounts, the account behavior, um, really any information that's available historically, and then 
uh, the accounts themselves, the content, as well as similar accounts and content, right, that we know where it's originated. And we're basically using, you know, predictive analytics, AI, and machine learning to try to make an educated guess as to if we're seeing, you know, a, a tweet or a, a Facebook post, did it originate from an account that looks very similar to accounts that we know are based in or um, representing the interest of a nation state? Right. Interesting that you that you use AI technology to find this stuff. Uh, as I understand it, Mark, some of your research, you know, has shown that these these accounts are essentially bots generated by AI in the first place. It's not actual humans who are typing this stuff up and putting it on the uh, uh, on social media. It's it's artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I, but just before, I want to address that point because it's, it's so key going forward. But I just think I want to just continue for a second what Zach was saying about the notion of attribution. I think as well when we determine who is behind campaigns, it can be hard. And I, and I, and I talk in, in, in my upcoming book about the notion of disinformation supply chains. Because in some examples, you have like the cheap Macedonian uh, you know, factory where people are paid $1,000 a month to, to create fake content in English in, uh, about the US elections, right? happens, or the Philippines, right? But then there's the acceptable face of this industry. This is the Cambridge Analyticas of the world, right? And, and just to give a, a concrete example, that's not even, that's hiding in plain sight. If you look at the FIRA filings, you'll see that SCL Social, or Cambridge Analytica's parent company, were contracted by a uh, sort of British PR firm working for the UAE to create those, to create Facebook adverts, framing Qatar, for example, as a terrorist supporting tape. State and you can go on these public documents and you can see screenshots of the adverts that they designed, right? Hmm. It's there in plain sight, and this is a company that operates legally uh, in probably you know prestigious surroundings. And there's plenty of examples. Wait, of the Cambridge documents. Analytica company, SCL, SCL yeah, Social. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They filed as agents of the uh, UAE government. So Project or? Associates were working for the UAE Supreme Media Council, and they worked with SCL Social to create this campaign. Okay. Um, but there's a filing, it's, yeah. uh, it's public. And right. you know, this, this is not a secret, but it's, the work they're doing is actually quite phenomenal because they are in, actively engaged in promoting tensions, social tensions, uh, and that could potentially lead to conflict, making money off it, and this is happening in plain sight. So you know, before we go down to these kind of talks about uh, why do people believe this kind of stuff, and this taps into exactly what you've been saying and Zach's been saying, is that so much of the disinformation has an active proponent propelling that forward. They, yeah. There's people who want to believe that, and the different interest groups behind that are complex, and it's not just nation states, and we, we should get away from that as well. But at some point along the line, these intermediaries should be held accountable, or there should be legislation targeting those. So when we talk about legislation or regulating social media companies, it's actually a far more expansive environment than just looking at those companies. Yeah. But in terms of AI, I mean, AI, I think, is, you know, people talk about AI all the time, and that, of course, is going to be the new frontier and a, a serious one. And one of the interesting things that I looked at recently, and it's becoming increasingly common, is, is AI-generated images. People talk about deep fake videos, right? The ability to be able to create a video of someone that looks exactly like them and to be able to say something being harmful. Last year, I worked on an investigation, and again, this shows the transnational links of of disinformation that we need to focus on, especially emanating from this region. A, a group, an unknown entity, possibly a PR firm, or you know, whether it be in the Philippines or Mayfair in London, we don't know, but someone who is very competent in English, managed to trick about 46 different international news organizations, including the Washington Times, uh, Spiked, South China Morning Post, Asia Times. They can manage to trick multiple organizations into publishing about 80 different op-eds, analysis articles, written by people who did not exist, right? The people only existed on social media, right? These were Twitter accounts. They had a Twitter account, a Facebook account, a LinkedIn account. Half of them had photos that were stole from someone else's profile. The other half had photos that were likely generated by, uh, you know, artificial intelligence. So very credible looking human faces that are unique, that you can't trace back because they're unique. Uh, and you know you can just go to a website. This person does not exist. Com. Click refresh, and every time you click refresh, you get a brand new AI-generated image face. And they were doing this, and they fooled, and it worked. And, it and who people. is doing this? We don't know. But the thing is, you look at the content and this time, and the reason it was on my radar as someone looks at propaganda. The narrative indicated that, that this was clearly 
I mean, why would you mislead so many people unless it was for sort of nefarious purposes? But the information there was being promoted was, again, it was targeting Turkey, Qatar, and Iran, you know, criticizing the, the policies of those countries. So that and also the, the Saudis yeah. and, the, and the Emiratis. Pro positively, because a few of the pieces yeah. were also praising UAE's response to COVID-19, right? So okay. there was also this lionization part. So, you know, That's a tip-off right there, it's a tip right? Off, but yeah. Again, it talks about attribution being hard, but yeah. this is AI being used in a particular way. And then there's the AI in terms of generating text. So bots now, and, and I, I think this ties in with what um, one of the previous panelists was saying about social media companies talk about using AI to combat. And I think, I think Zach will talk more about how to, to use AI to combat things. But we still see very crude forms of manipulation using automated accounts. So automated accounts, for example, on Twitter, they post content automatically, whether it's retweeting or you put a single message in and it just puts them out. You know, it's a bit of script and it, and it puts it out there. That's computational propaganda, right? And, and you speak to, to social media companies and they say, computational propaganda is easy to deal with. We do that. And I'm still finding it all the time, right? It still exists. So they're not being truthful or they have an exaggerated sense of their own abilities to combat it. Um, but what the, re the real, you can see, it's pretty obvious, because often bots will just either retweet or just post the same content. What's scary now is things like uh, GPT-3. So this is a, a new artificial intelligence that can create text. So if you read the Guardian newspaper, they got this AI to write an article. Right? It had a few inputs, but it wrote a, an, an analysis piece about what AI, what AI was, and it was very convincing. Right? And so once people are able to use this technology to produce content on things like Twitter, it's going to be a lot harder to determine for a machine or a human whether that content has been produced by a robot or a real person. And right now we're at a point where it's quite easy to identify bots and, and generated content. But I think we're getting to a place where AI is going to be so sophisticated that bots are going to be the, the, the more sophisticated forms of, of, of manipulation in terms of information. And, and that's quite a scary time. So combating that is is, is clearly where people like yeah. Zach come in. Well, that, that, I mean, you know, Zach, your firm's purpose is to expose this sort of thing. Um, it sounds like it could actually present quite a challenge for what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think expose. Expose, yes, but I, more importantly, counter. And I think the an analogy I like to use is it's like steroids in, in sports. Because whatever the league, if you take baseball, for example, whatever they're testing for today, the players stopped using a year or two or three ago, right? So you're always trying to play catch up. And I think the point Mark made, you know, the, the technology, the capabilities are advancing this stuff so fast that it puts governments, private sector in a predicament, which is, do you continue to try to play catch up or are you willing to play by whatever the different set of rules that your adversaries are playing with, right? Or no rules at all. And I think it very quickly creates a gray area. So one of the things that we look at from a countering mis and disinformation perspective is if you can understand what narratives are resonating, why they're resonating, then you can almost take the same approach to that, uh, the, the, uh, to that analysis and apply it to the messaging or the counter message that you're thinking about deploying to say, is this going to resonate with my intended audience and drive whatever your desired outcome is? And I think, so that's all messaging specific, right? And there's a lot of benefit to being able to, you know, quote unquote, optimize the message for different audiences. But I think the point that Mark brought up earlier about the messenger is critical, right? Because if you think about, you know, go back to vaccine hesitancy, if somebody doesn't trust the government and the government is putting out messaging saying here's why you should get vaccinated it's not going to resonate it's not going to change their mind right there's got to be sort of that um, community credibility somebody within a given community that you know can speak to these people and try to get them off their existing belief system and over to something that better aligns in that case with the government so um, that's one of the areas that in addition to tr trying to optimize the messaging it's about identifying the optimal messenger um, and the last point I'll make on that, which it, it was interesting because at sort of a very broad scale, we wanted to understand for a U.S. adult audience, um, where is their trust right now or the you know, perceptions of different sources? And so we took the exact same text and told, I think we had about 50,000 person panel and 
some of them were told that this originated from a U.S. news organization. Others told it was foreign, and then we went more specific, said Russian, Chinese. And what we found generally, right, and this was political affiliations aside, that the majority, and it's a slight majority, but a majority of U.S. adults find foreign news sources more trustworthy than domestic. Huh. So that's, that's our baseline, right? We're starting at, obviously, a significant disadvantage if you're coming at it from the U.S. government's perspective or yeah. a U.S. news organization trying to convince people that you're credible. Right. Um, let's uh, talk about the responsibilities of the social media companies and um, uh, what they're doing wrong now and you know if there's a way to get them to do better you know we had the the, the testimony of, of Francis Haugen the Facebook whistleblower um, uh, you know just recently talking about you know how Facebook's own research showed that um, the company was um, using because of its algorithms was continuing to spread a lot of you know bogus content um, and that Facebook was putting you know profits over you know its pledge to curb this um, what did you make of uh, Haugen's testimony and um, and the response to it Mark? I mean Haugen's testimony was compelling uh, she wasn't the first person to raise these issues uh, I think, I don't know if Sophie Zhang, a, a previous whistleblower, also raised specific issues, and other Facebook employees have been very, have publicly gone on the record to saying that Facebook has often found it promotes bad for the world content. That's Facebook terminology. Bad for the world content is content that is, could be seen as disinformation, hate speech, or harmful. And it's another example of when the problem is clearly known about, it's in the public sphere, we have, a, a, we have, like we saw two weeks ago, where we had another whistleblower who raises this and hopefully gets it to a higher level. But again, I think this recalcitrance and this, it seems that nothing changes despite these numerous scandals relating to, to social media. And I think all it does is reflect, again, a general unwillingness of them to harm their own business model. And so I think it's very right to be cynical about social media companies and their intent. It doesn't mean they aren't doing good things or trying to do good things. It's just I think the, the, the scale of harms is often outweighed by their, their particular business model, which relies on generating engagement for advertising revenue and monetizing individuals, uh, you, know, you know, actually as datafied subjects. So, so if Facebook brought you in and said, okay, you have, you know, um, uh, total power to change how we're uh -huh. doing business right now to address the issues you've identified. I go to that do? server farm with the problem and unplug it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, seriously, like, I, I, you know, I think, um, firstly, in a PR sense, you know, I, if I had a dime for every time a Facebook employee, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, if I had a dime for every time a Facebook employee said that, uh, you know, we, we, we care about human rights and Facebook is important, getting people communicated, the issue is complicated, I'd be, a, I'd be a rich person. So firstly, the marketing thing, I'd drop that line that they tried to use. I would, if, again, if I was Facebook, there's a difference between me being in Facebook and working for, say, a legislative authority, but I would also, uh, acting altruistically, uh, revise my relationships with countries that were known human rights abusers, right? You know, that's not, you know, just as the arms industry has export regulations, right? You talk about corporate due diligence. This is the thing, right? So if we want to talk about the business sector doing more, having to rely on them is always tricky. Uh, but within the framework of corporate due diligence, you could put human rights to the fore. It's no good saying we support human rights and just focus on this notion of free speech uh, because that's one of many f human rights just as the right to free and fair elections is. And so they tend to focus on this free speech thing, but the issue with that is that it's also misleading. Because as I said before, how do you quantify, and, and, and Facebook don't necessarily, or do they do this, and another recommendation would be you need to actually have a department that does that. How do you actually quantify on the balance of things whether your platform is being used in a country or in a context to facilitate human rights or actually work against them? Why can't you determine that? Because once you determine that, you can say, actually, our platform is being on the balance in this country, country X, being exploited as human rights, uh, to facilitate human rights violations. Therefore, we can, should not operate in this country. That's me saying that. Obviously, Facebook like, yeah, that's a business model issue. But I'm saying that's what I do. 
Yeah, but I also just, you know, given what Zach was talking about before, about the way um, uh, state actors can disguise their own role sure. using PR firms in the Philippines or whatever, right. um, that could make, you know, the Burmese government could use a Filipino PR firm to spread messages about the Rohingya, and you wouldn't, it, because it's coming from, oh. you know, a, you know, a, 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 a different account that's not Burmese, yeah. you might not immediately. Well, I, I, I think absolutely. I, I, but identify that yeah. as I mean, state I th propaganda. I think engagement with civil society is a really important thing. And Facebook and Twitter, particularly, they do this in an informal level. Facebook more. Facebook are more proactive in making themselves appear like they're doing something. And mm -hmm. they're bigger, they have more money. But you have not, numerous uh, NGOs that deal with either human rights abuses, tech-related NGOs that are country-specific, that might focus on Myanmar or, or the Gulf. You need to actually create a formal mechanism of engagement with these countries as the reliable eyes and ears on the ground in terms of human rights abuses, right? You don't necessarily need, you know, you, they, those organizations exist, they're the experts in it, and they're the ones that could make those, uh, or help you make those decisions about whether or not uh, the country in question where Facebook's operating is being exploited in a specific way. And of course, it doesn't obviate those issues you raised. Okay, I, I mean, human rights abuses is, you know, an, an area, you know, a lot of people could agree on and, and mm. you know, regardless of where it's coming from, you could sort of identify what might be, you know, promotion of human rights abuses. But what do you do about the example I, I, I started out with, uh, which is uh, the Italy, Italy Gate YouTube video that was being circulated and spread by the chief of staff of uh, the president of the United States? Um, I think as a company or as, as a, maybe a, an alternative solution, legislative-wise? Uh, both, starting with, you know, Google owns yeah. YouTube. Uh, you know, it's being, this is being spread on its yeah, platform. Yeah. What responsibility did Google have um, to curb something like that? Need, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they need to be taken down. They need to be taken down quickly, because the longer this information or false news uh, uh, lingers in the information space, it's a problem. And, you know, some people raise the issue of what about freedom of speech, and I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a moot point because when something is patently false, and, or, and it's particularly when it, it, it could cause harm to specific communities or minorities or otherwise, then there's a, also an argument to make that it's in violation of, of several other laws. Yeah. Uh, so that needs to be taken down. I don't think there's a solid argument for keeping up. And possibly, if someone is a habitual spreader of harmful information, and by habitual, I mean they repeatedly do it in a certain way. Then there's also, you know, legal options to go down in that kind of mechanism. Right. right? And I think that could be entertaining. Yeah, but I do have to say, you know, th these things can get tricky. Mm. Um, you know, there are some who will tell you that cite instances where uh, Facebook and Twitter were taking content down. Um, for instance, um, uh, they were taking down content um, that suggested that the... Uh, that COVID, you know, may have come from a Chinese state lab leak as opposed to naturally uh, from, you know, uh, open air uh, markets in Wuhan. And at the time, that was viewed as patently false. Today, it's an open question as to whether COVID may have come from a Wuhan lab leak, right? Yeah, I mean, it's true. You will get false positives and you'll get false negatives. And this is, of course, an issue. And also the part of the issue is here that, you know, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube did have this blanket, no COVID-19 disinformation. It wasn't necessarily a nuanced approach. Um, but I think that's interesting in itself because it shows that these platforms are actually, if, if the pol pol politics are right, ready to curb disinformation, right? And, and I think that's interesting because it suggests that they should and they can and they ought to it doesn't, of course, it doesn't mean that you won't get these, these instances where something that could be very truthful is censored, of course. Um, but, you know, it's the nature of, uh, you know, curating information that you'll get these false positives and false negatives. And this happens anyway. So I think on the balance of it, it's better to spread patently erroneous information that is harmful to others uh, and make occasional mistakes uh, than the other way around and, and have virulent disinformation spreading in the name of free speech that can cause harm not just to people or communities, but the fundamental tenets of, say, 
a democracy like the United States, right? Yeah. Um, Zach, same question to you. If uh, you got put in charge of uh, Facebook tomorrow and were given total power to change how they do business, what would you do? So if I was with Facebook and had total power, probably nothing, because I think Facebook's not unlike, or you know, the tech or social media is not unlike other industries where you do, you know, just get right up to the line of what's legal or you know possible to maximize profits. So I think if the incentive structure changed, whether that's through you know regulation or otherwise, then you may see change. I don't think Facebook's going to take it on themselves. If they do, it's going to be for PR purposes, and I think then it's just enough to get the story to go away, right? Um, and I don't know. So you would not change the way they do business. Well, I'm saying if I came in, you know, as a consultant to change their business, for sure, right? If I yeah. was working at Facebook, I don't know that I could say now that I wouldn't do anything different. No, Zuckerberg calls you up and says, look, I got to get, you know, these uh, senators off my ass. Uh, you know, what should I do? Tell me. So I think um, we put a paper out with uh, uh, Polaris, which um, focuses, NGO focused on human trafficking, runs the trafficking hotline. And it was really interesting because the, you know, there's a lot of uh, research out there about mm -hmm. the path to radicalization, right, yeah, from okay. a um, terrorism standpoint. And we looked at the path to radicalization within, you know, sort of a human trafficking disinformation context. And there was evidence of this with people that, you know, were in the Capitol on January 6th. And I think I'm, I'm going to get to the point here, which is um, the, it, it's tricky, right? Because there's obvious disinformation that YouTube or Facebook should take down, right? But if you think about Save the Children, right? On the surface, who doesn't want to help save the children? Right, and a lot of the content, a lot of the accounts that are spreading this content, we call naive spreaders, right? Because there's no, you know, malicious or nefarious intent there. They want to save the children, but we see that as, you know, sort of a, a, a gateway into more radical QAnon content. But it's the thing that starts sucking these people in, and this mm. is where you have, mm. you know, these algorithms take over. So I think the two things that I would do to actually answer your question is one, I would look at it from a more nuanced standpoint, right? It's a path; it's not binary. And two, I would look at, you know, the algorithmic amplification of this. And like Mark said, they know that they can control this to a certain mm. extent. It's when they choose to or not. And I think there should be uh, both internal and external uh, regulation. Um, that put some parameters in place to uh, try to lessen the, not only the spread, but the impact of uh, this radicalizing information. You know, um, we, I did a, uh, uh, I, I have a podcast uh, called Conspiracy Land, mm -hmm. uh, in which I look at conspiracy theories and um, how they, um, uh, who spreads them and how they evolve. And um, one series I did in that was last year, Trump, uh, this is uh, May of 2020, uh, is uh, super pissed off at Joe Scarborough, Morning Joe, and sort of goes off on a series of tweets, um, basically making the completely bogus claim that Joe Scarborough had murdered a member, a, a, a woman staffer 21 years ago when he was a member mm. of Congress. Um, and this was actually a crazy conspiracy theory that originated among Democratic partisans on the left when Scarborough was a Republican member of Congress and then gets adopted by Trump um, uh, to bash Scarborough. And one thing I discovered in the course of reporting this is that Twitter had this internal policy where uh, world leaders were given free reign, freer reign, to tweet anything they want because that was part of the democratic dialogue uh, in that country. And it seems to me that Facebook has had a similar policy where um, uh, world leaders get this, um, you know, sort of extra ability to spread all sorts of nonsense. Um, and, um, you know, since then, obviously, Trump has been kicked off Twitter. But um, it does strike me that uh, there was quite a double standard there. And um, 
I wonder, you know, should we, should that have been called out uh, sooner and, um, and, and the social media companies be stricter about this? I mean, I, I, I would think so. But I, I think this, this is a very interesting aspect, again, of talking about this universe, these universal rules that are then selectively applied. Yeah. Um, and I think you, you look at, I remember I was doing a study of, I was looking at Twitter's political advertising. So Twitter banned political advertising, paid for advertising, right? Uh, the idea was that no election should be bought, right? So this valiant principle being kind of heralded. And, uh, and then I was, I was trying to figure out how in this region, there was propaganda, uh, well, there was, uh, you know, these kind of messages about a certain state leader in the Middle East, really like talking about how amazing he was, right? And I thought, is, is this political advertising? Because the function that was, it was a paid, paid promotion. So I looked on Twitter's political advertising, it says no political advertising is allowed. And I was like, that's odd, because this looks like it. I went to FAQs, and they have a caveat hidden in the FAQs that basically allows for local displays or customary displays of you know, demonstrations of loyalty to particular leaders, right? So, but this is kind of absurd, right? You could, in theory, there could be a dictator somewhere and, you know, where free speech is not tolerated, but it's fine to, like, talk about how great this person is, uh, but you can't then run a political campaign in a democratic state, right? So what this shows is that Facebook, Twitter, these companies talk about universal human rights, but are localizing their laws depending on the countries they exist in, right? And this has come up a number of times. It came up with Netflix when they banned a certain... Uh, uh, series or uh, episode of a series uh, in the Middle East because it contravened local laws. How can you respect local law if some elements of that law aren't actually in line with the things you say about human rights? And I think that's interesting. But to finish off, because I think you know, running a time, I want to kind of make this point that needs to be made is there's a lack of transparency from these companies anyway. You said you found out this internal kind of thing, yeah. right? I, I was in a closed meeting with Twitter and Facebook the other day, and I just asked, for example, one of the issues we knew about Myanmar and the genocide that happened there was that Facebook really didn't have any people speaking the local language who could moderate content, right? So I asked, I, I just asked, how many people do you have, for example, moderating Arabic content on Twitter? How many does that compare to English? What's the ratio? They, didn't, they don't know, they didn't tell me, they don't public it. We don't know. We don't have the ability to transparently determine what mechanisms they have to combat even things like moderation. We don't know their capacity. Well, don't, don't, don't they just use AI and Google they use AI, translators? It, they, have different, they have different levels of it, but um, yeah. sometimes it does go to a personal thing. But also, you know, when it comes to things like training uh, those, you know, those, those processes on that, that's also very problematic. But they, they just don't tell you. And this is another thing, is that people in, around the world are beholden to these corporations in Silicon Valley who, in my experience, and, and this is this theory of tech, it's called techno-colonialism, it's you exploit markets in the developing world or the global south, make money from those markets, but with less responsibility. Because at the end of the day, if the politics permits, you can get away with it. And so, you know, I think that's what we have this issue is. I think in the past three years, particularly in Arabic language Twitter, I, myself and other analysts have noticed how Twitter seemed to ignore more and more the kind of problematic content that you see in non-English languages, ignore it and let it fester. So these companies are not just acting universally in a, in a way that's problematic. It's different depending on the region and the politics. And this is a problem because it's unequal and it's leading to disproportionate problems in markets you know, that are fly beneath the radar. And I think that's something that you... So you just to, to sort of, you know, um, square the circle here, um, Jason, regulation? Is that what we need? And how would that work? Um, I, I don't know, and I, my, my personal view is I don't think so. The, the fundamental question that you know, I think about and, and um, I think really needs to be asked and examined is who should be the arbiter of truth? Is it government? Is it the social media companies? Because I don't think we can trust ourselves, right, to moderate the content we've seen, right. you know, without any other moderation. And, and can we trust the government? And can we trust the Do social you want media to, companies? Right. right. Yeah. And that that becomes the issue. And I, yeah. you know, I think Mark's right. Like, there should be more transparency about what is being done. But I think you brought up a perfect example in the COVID origins use case, yeah. right? Is it true? Is it not true? Should it be removed or flagged? Should the social media companies yeah. be making that determination? 
Should the government, should we wait for, and that, that's where I struggle. So, you know, I, I don't know um, is yeah, I mean, a bad the, answer, the, but the answer. And, and what about lifting the, or, or reforming Section 230 of the Communications Act that gives the social media companies immunity from civil litigation over what it's published? My concern, I think it should be looked at for sure. My concern is that we swing way too far to the other end of the spectrum and it's probably a, a bad way to describe it, but to me it may be scarier to have government acting as that arbiter of truth than whatever the social media companies are doing right well, now. Well, you know, modifying 230 wouldn't necessarily make the government the arbiters mm -hmm. of truth. It would allow private citizens to sue the social media companies that publish falsehoods about them, right? Correct. Um, I think it gets the, into very tricky territory, though, um, right? Because at some point, somebody's going to have to make the determination. Right now, if you've sort of got, you know, no liability for what's on your platform and nobody can come after you, um, that changes, you know, cons uh, does right. a 180 degree turn. If, People are coming after you, and you know somebody's got to make the determination as you know what's true, what's not. Right. Well, um, this has been a fascinating discussion about a big problem for which there are, does not appear to be any easy answers. Uh, but I want to thank the two of you for uh, what has been a really enlightening discussion. Thank you very much, Thanks, Mike. Thank, thank you. you.